Hi, this is Steve with OS Nexus, and we've got another fun video for you today. We're going to be setting up an object storage configuration using Quantastore, uh, which uses Ceph technology underneath. So we're going to start with an overview of object storage, dive into the network configuration steps. We're going to set up a LACP bond uh, for the networking, and then we're going to move on to some of the things that are really important to get right as pre-flight checks, like setting up the NTP servers, make sure that we're not going to run into clock skew problems in the future, setting up the license keys on there, uh, making sure that the boxes are upgraded. And then after those pre-flight checks are all sorted out, we're going to dive right into creating the cluster and setting up the cluster. So that involves first creating the cluster, of course, and then adding the media to the cluster. Then we'll make an object storage pool, also called an object storage zone turn on the S3 gateways. So we'll have those running on all the different nodes that make up our cluster so we can get the most performance out of our object storage configuration. And then uh, we're gonna go into starting to provision storage. So we're gonna make a tenant, we're gonna make a user and then provision some S3 buckets. And then we're just gonna demo accessing one of those buckets using an app called S3 Browser. So without further ado, let's dive in. So I've already gone ahead and set up six Quantastore boxes. You can install Quantastore onto bare metal servers just by downloading our ISO image, putting it onto a USB stick, and then bare metal installing it just like any other operating system. So I've done that for six different boxes. And in fact, we're gonna use virtual machines here today, virtual Quantastore boxes, but everything that we go over is gonna be identical whether or not you're deploying on physical hardware or virtual hardware. In this case, it was just easier for me to set up for the demo using some virtual machines. So when you first log into Quantastore for the first time, you're going to put in admin for the default user admin account, and then you're going to put in password as the password. Of course, you're going to want to change the default password to something new the first time that you log in. Uh, I'm going to go and just skip that step here because we're just focused on, on doing a demo here today. What I'm showing you right now is what we call a storage grid. So that's the Quantastore control plane. And inside of Quantastore, we have six nodes. So these six nodes, we could divide up into a couple of Ceph clusters, but today we're gonna to make one Ceph cluster out of all six nodes. Once you install the Quantastore S, there's like two steps that you need to do to form the grid. One is to go over here and click create grid, and I've already got it formed, so it's just saying, hey, it's already there. Um, you would just give it a name and click okay. And then after the grid is formed, you're gonna add nodes to the grid. And you can, in this case, I've got my systems on 10.0. 8.70 through uh, 75. So I could give it a range, put in the admin password for those systems and click OK and that would form the grid. We're going to go first check on each of these nodes to make sure that the networking is set up properly from an NTP server perspective. So by default, we have our nodes set up to use the public NTP servers and you can go to each node and check and see which NTP servers they're using. They're all going to be set up using the public NTP servers. What you really want with a scale out cluster is to use a local NTP server. So you want to use an NTP server or a pair of NTP servers rather that are in your data center that are going to have very low latency connection to them because clock skew is a challenge with any scale out architecture. And so having good local NTP servers is a great way to solve that. I'm going to just use the default NTP servers because these are fine for the demonstration today. Here I've got trial edition licenses applied across all the boxes. You can get trial edition license keys from the OS Nexus website. Go to osnexus.com and click the try now button. It will go and get you four license keys and you can go back to get more. Community edition is a free edition of Quantastore. You can also get that from our website. You want to go to the downloads page. Uh, to get to the ISO image to download that, but the try now button will also get you access to community edition keys as well. One of the next things that you would do is you would set up the networking on each of these nodes. If I click on the grid, I can see the IP addresses assigned to all the different boxes. On 99% of scale out configurations, what you're gonna do is you're gonna have a couple of management ports like this, and then you're gonna have some high performance ports that are your 100 gigabit, dual 100 gig that you're gonna to bond together using LACP bonding. For the demo today, I'm not gonna go through to set up an LACP bond, but I'm gonna show you how to do that on so that you can do that on your equipment. The way to do that is you can just click on the port and right click and bring up create bonded port. And now I can go and choose what system I wanna create that on. You're typically gonna be choosing LACP layer three, four or, or, L, or layer two, depending on how you want 
your networking setup, and then you're going to grab the, the high speed 100 gig ports or 25 gig ports. You turn on jumbo frames and then give it an IP address for your newly formed bonded port. And here I'm only selecting a single port because this is a, a demonstration config, but typically you're going to see two physical interfaces down there that you're going to bond together. So if you had two 100s, you're going to make a 200 gigabit bond out of those. And then you would repeat that process for each of the nodes. And then once your networking is all configured, then we would jump on to the next step, which is diving into setting up the cluster. The first step in creating a cluster is to click the create cluster button and then select all the nodes that you want to create the cluster out of it's automatically selected the available ip uh, on each of the nodes you can have a separate interface for the front end and back end but in general we recommend using as i mentioned before an lacp bonded uh, interface that is used for both the front end and the back end traffic now is also the time to go turn on encryption so uh, software encryption is supported across all media types. So whether or not you've got hard drives or SSDs or a mix of, of the two, you can always turn on software encryption. The performance impact of software encryption can be anywhere from 20 to 30 percent. Kind of really depends on the, the CPUs that are in your system. And then the hardware encryption is available if you're using all flash media that is Opal 2 or Ruby compliant. So there's newer uh, standards for self-encrypting drives. You can leverage that if you're doing an all flash deployment. Pretty much leave everything as default. If your data is highly compressible, uh, go for enabling compression. Otherwise, I would just leave that at the default. And then the domain suffix has to be set. That'll be needed later when we go and set up the object storage gateways. And we're gonna click OK. And it's gonna go deploy our Ceph cluster. So right now, what it's doing is it's setting up what are called the monitors. The monitors keep track of all the services that are running and the monitor knows when those devices are online and offline. So if they go offline, the monitor is able to communicate with clients saying, hey, don't talk to these particular devices right now. They're offline. And when they come back online, the monitor gathers that information as well and communicates that out so that those devices can rebalance with the cluster. If I expand here, we'll see all of our nodes that are in the cluster and you'll see that it's put a monitor on the first node. After that, it's going to deploy monitors on the, on the subsequent nodes. And you can add more monitors after the initial set are, are deployed uh, just by clicking this button here, Add Monitor. You can also remove monitors. So if you don't want a monitor running on a specific system, you can just click to remove it. In this, our, in this particular uh, configuration, we're going to run OSDs, which are the data devices, on all the nodes. And we're going to have S3 gateways on all the nodes. Now I have six nodes, so it went ahead and deployed five monitors for us. I'm checking on the status of these monitors. It can take a minute for these to transition to the healthy state. And so we're going to give it just one more minute. All right, our cluster setup is done. We've got our monitors all healthy now, and we're ready to move on to the next step. And the next step is to add all the OSDs into the cluster. So we're going to go to this next tab, data and journal devices, and we're going to click on this button at the top, create OSDs and journals. And here we're going to go and uh, add these small 10 gigabyte devices as our data devices. And we're gonna use these larger ones as our SSDs, our offload devices and our write log devices. There's a little button in the bottom right hand corner you can click called auto config. That's gonna go and select all the data devices for us and put those in here. This tab here is where you select all your data devices. So if you're setting up a hybrid configuration with hard drives, you would put all the hard drives in here and you would put all your SSDs in here. You can also do hybrid configurations where you're using a mix of SSDs and NVMEs. And you can also just do all, you know, one type like all NVME or all SSDs. You don't need to add journal devices or hard drives. Then you want to have uh, enough SSDs to accelerate them so you get great performance out of your cluster. Real briefly, this is just saying, yes, I do want to create metadata offload uh, chunks out of the SSD storage. And I also want write log uh, chunks taken out of the SSD storage to accelerate all of my hard drives. So each hard drive here is going to get two gigs for write log and two gigs or three gigs for metadata database. Because I'm doing a small configuration here, typically this is going to be uh, somewhere around 2% of the overall capacity of the drive. The write log is always two gigs. So that is just going to be two at all times. So now that we've, so we've selected all the media, we're, we're, we're ready to go. I'm just going to go and click OK, and it's going to go add all of our media to the cluster. This is going to take a couple of minutes, so I'm going to pause here. OK, now all of our OSDs have been created, 
and we're just now waiting for them to transition from the initializing state to this normal exists up state. So that's going to take us just another minute. We can see now all of our OSDs are reporting as normal exists up and we are ready to move on to creating our object storage zone. So to do that, we're going to go over to the scale out storage pools tab and we're going to click on create object storage pool. Now you can leave the default zone in here, um, or if you are setting up something like Veritas Net Backup or other uh, systems where the name of the zone needs to match one of the A Amazon Web Services S3 zones, you can just put in US East 1 uh, in both of these, and that will make sure that the region identifier there matches an AWS zone. That's really important, again, for compatibility with some products. So if we have four data and two coding blocks, we can lose two servers out of the six and still have no downtime. If we have more coding chunks like four and three, this would allow us with three servers that could be offline. The downside of having something like two and two is that now you only have 50% usable capacity. So for every two data chunks, you've got two coding blocks and the coding blocks are the same size as the data chunks. So that's not super efficient. In this case, we have six nodes, so that means that we can have a total of six chunks, and the most efficient way that we can deploy is four data chunks and two coding chunks. And now we just click OK, and it's going to go set up our object storage pool. We can see the task running here as it's going through and creating pools for our object storage zone. And there's two internal pools that it creates. One is the data pool that is set up with erasure coding. That's where all of our bucket data is going to go in as we upload objects. Those are all going into the data pool. The other pool is where all of the metadata is stored, the bucket index, the names of all of the objects that are in the bucket. All of that stuff is stored in a second pool, and that is automatically placed onto flash storage when you have added flash OSDs, so flash storage OSDs. We're done setting up these pools. You can see that uh, they are in the initializing state. It's gonna take a few seconds for those to transition to the normal state. And then we're ready to go on to the next step, uh, which is to create our S3 gateways. You can see the progress of any action that is happening in the grid right down here in the, in the uh, task view. Um, you can clear this out periodically to uh, make it easier to, to see because here we've been doing a few configuration steps and so we've had a lot of task progress show up and there we're just going to clear that out. So now we can see that everything's transitioned now to the normal state. You can see that we've got our four plus two erasure coded pool and our replicated pool for the bucket index and we're ready to go set up the S3 gateways. The S3 gateways are how the clients are able to come into our object storage cluster and read and write objects. These are the components, these are the services that are actually serving out the S3 protocol. And we wanna run these uh, S3 gateways on every single node because that's gonna give us our best performance. And the S3 gateways are automatically gonna get deployed on this IP address, this port that we selected here. And it's gonna use the port number 7480. So if we're configuring an S3 client to come in, we're gonna to wanna to point it to 7480 on any one of these IP addresses. But now what if you want it to be load balanced? Well, to get it load balanced, we're gonna choose enable, we're gonna turn on the load balancer. That's gonna automatically deploy the load balancer on all the boxes. And instead of going and pointing my S3 client to 7480, I could point it to 8480, and then that is gonna automatically distribute my connection across all of the different nodes. So the first time I connect and grab an object, it might be from the first node. The second time it could be from the fourth node and all the different clients are gonna go in through, if they go in through the load balancer, you're gonna get it nice and evenly distributed load across all the systems. And that's also gonna give you the best performance. And one last thing, if you have your own certificates, now is the time to go browse and grab that. This will go and put a certificate into the S3 gateway and apply that certificate to all the different boxes. And that way you can bring your own certificate into the cluster. And there we go, we're gonna click okay. That's gonna go set up all of our S3 gateways. All of those services show up in this area up here. So as it goes and starts creating our S3 gateways, we're gonna to start to see all of those appear in this section. If I go to the S3 gateways uh, tab, we can see the various uh, bits of information on each of the gateways as they're created. 
and now they're all healthy and in the normal state. It's very easy to go set up a tenant. I'm just gonna go in here and create a, a tenant. We'll call this one Pepsi. And the display name, you've got more flexibility. You can put in uh, whatever you like and you can put in a, a description here. And then we can go down here and make another tenant. We can do that. And now we've got two different companies inside of our object store with two separate namespaces. And now when we go create users, uh, we can associate those users with either Pepsi or Dr. Pepper. So we can go here and make a Steve and click multi-tenancy and say, yeah, Steve works at Dr. Pepper. And I can put in here, Steve, you, and Steve at osnexus.com. And uh, now there's my new user account. If I wanna create other users, I can just do that. If you don't want it associated with a tenant, just don't check this box. Don't associate with a tenant. You don't have to do that. Uh, now that we've got a user account, uh, we can start to create buckets. Uh, all buckets have to be owned by a S3 user. Um, so it's important to go create your users first before you dive into creating S3 buckets. And now we're gonna go in here and say create S3 bucket. We can do that from the right click pop-up menu or we can do that here from the toolbar at the top and we can put in whatever you, uh, bucket name we want. So we could call this beverages and click OK. And that's all there is to creating buckets. You can see it creating the bucket right here. And then when it's done, we're gonna see that show up in the bucket list. And it's also gonna get associated with our tenant, which is Dr. Pepper. At this point, we can go in and access our bucket through S3 browser or any S3 API. We can use command line utilities that talk S3 like the AWS CLI to see which URLs to connect to. You're gonna to wanna to come over here. So the URL to go and access the object storage is shown right here under the S3 gateways. And I can just bring up another window here. This is a great way as a quick health check to go see, is my S3 gateway up and running? Is it responding? And the same thing, instead of going directly to the S3 gateway, we could go through the load balancer. Similarly, through the load balancer, we're seeing the same data, which is exactly what you wanna see. There's one last bit I wanna go over, and that's how to create new access keys for your user account. So you can go into the UI, go to the users and tenants, the S3 users and tenants section, and just right click here and you can say manage view S3 user access keys. From there, you can create new keys just by saying add key and it will generate a new key pair for you. You can put in your own access key and secret key if you want. Otherwise, just click OK and that will create a new key pair for you. Uh, if I want to see the access keys and secret keys for this particular user account, I can just click uh, show and hide keys and then can copy and paste these. So I'm going to bring over my S3 browser window. This is a Windows utility that you can use to access S3 object store, whether that's at Amazon or a corner store cluster. I'm gonna go into this config and you can see I put in the IP address of one of the systems that's running our S3 gateway. And I've given it the port to the load balancer, which is port 8480. And you can see here, I've chosen signature V2 and I put in the secret key and the access key. I've chosen S3 compatible storage and I've made sure that I've checked use secure transfer SSL TLS. If you need to use signature V4 uh, in the current version of Quantastore, you'd need to go direct to the gateway, to the S3 gateway at port 7480. But that's it, you just save the changes. I can then just click and drag files over there and click and drag it. And you can see I just up uploaded this logo underscore seth.png. That's all I wanted to go over for the video today. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please write us at info at osnexus.com. Thanks.